Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, go ahead and leave a five-star review. I'm doing a bunch of stand-up. I'm recording an album on January 6th in Levittown in Long Island. Uh, that's the Governor's Comedy Club. So i got a bunch of shows leading up to that recording uh, i'm going to be with the comedians of the compound december 11th uh, at tiffs in morris plains new jersey then i'll be going to uh hartford connecticut that's a funny bone there in hartford december 12th december 13th the little rock looney bin in arkansas and then i'll be back to texas back to dallas hyenas in dallas december 15th and 16th with aaron berg and anthony cumia and then lots more dates, but I'm really pushing the dates leading up to this album recording because it's going to be sick. It's going to be so fun. And yes, I did pick that date on purpose. <laughs> it's going to be great. I'm going to talk about it. It's going to be fun. Uh, quick shout out to uh, one of our sponsors. Standalone is a new Substack by Melissa McCutcheon, an artist and former professor who quit due to the corruption of academia. She publishes at least once a week on topics designed to offer some hope and insight into the bizarre groupthink world we're currently living in. You can subscribe at standalone.substack.com. It's free, and there are some really valuable bits of advice regarding individual empowerment and ways to stay true to your principles in the face of adversity. Just basically everything we talk about on this podcast. Uh, in fact, she published a piece recently about the wave of resignations we're seeing in response to the vaccine mandates for companies with 100 or more employees. And she weaves in her own story of her decision to leave academia. So go read and subscribe at standalone.substack.com. Thank you, guys. So excited to have this guest back on the show today. Uh, you may know her as Ms. <laughs> Ms. Florida 2016. Um, she is a correspondent for Real America's Voice and I'm going to say maybe a friend of mine. Who knows? I'm, that's where I'm hoping it's going. Karen Turk, how are you? Glad to have you back. <laughs> I'm great. I, I would love to be your friend. I'm honored to be your friend. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. And I cannot wait for your album. I'm excited. Woo! Yeah, I'm so excited too. Nick Searcy, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he is he's dropping uh, a documentary about January 6th, I think right I think on Thanksgiving. Um, so he, I mean, there were so many people that we both know that were there, like obviously myself included, but he was just shooting a movie with Gina Carano uh, and Samir Armstrong out in Montana for the last month. So it's great to see a lot of people who have been smeared and censored and kind of kicked out of Hollywood or blacklisted from Hollywood. It's great to see them getting work and thriving and, and finding a spot. So I'm very excited for that. And there's been so much Karen. Last time I saw you. myself. It seems yeah. like. It's a theme. It's a common theme. <laughs> Things are coming around. Yeah. Last time I saw you, Karen, we were in Nashville. Uh, the true and the, we were at the, and I just had a guy on yesterday, Jeffrey Smith, who I met at, in Nashville as well. He he's like an expert on uh, GMOs and and microbes and and like oh, a lot of stuff was over my head. But he's fascinating and so smart. Uh, so I made a lot of connections <laughs> at that convention. Was this was the truth about cancer alive? Do you have you been going to that convention? Every year, do you know those guys? Is or was was this your first time over there? You know, good people surround themselves, you know, and stick together. And I know you've met Charlene Bollinger, and I was introduced to her through a mutual friend of ours, and got to know her. And this was my first year at the event, and I was beyond impressed with what I saw. And speaking there was such an honor, and just being a part of that. But yeah, it's one of those things where. I didn't really know very much about the truth about cancer, but as soon as I started to get to know them and got to know Charlene and Ty and started to look at it, I'm like, this is so in my wheelhouse. These are my people. And uh, I had a great time in Nashville. It was amazing. It was awesome. At first I was like, uh, am I, I'm a podcaster. Like, do I, I don't really go to events like this. And then it was exactly that you get there and you're like, Oh, these are all like-minded people. We're all skeptical of the, of the media. And we all like kind of, our true seekers and and then you meet so many people oh i was censored off this i was kicked off of this platform i was i've had the the government come after me for xyz and i'm just like oh wow these are this is like a strong group <laughs> of people and then with ty and charlene they had i guess for people who you know 
we did a little bit of a live stream from the event, but in case any of you guys missed that when uh, the last time me and Karen were talking, I guess they had a like quite a few people in their family who died of cancer. So then they yeah. kind of both just woke up and were like, whoa, they, something is not working with the mainstream treatment. Um, and, and people need to have the freedom to explore other methods. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is you just get kind of bullied by the medical system to go straight to chemo, straight to the classic. Cause I watched my mother go through this too. She, she had brain cancer and, and like, they weren't really great at keeping us in the loop, but it's a scary process. And you, you kind of went through not the same thing, Karen, but dealing with your own, you know, mother's medical issues, and then they ended up uh, because my my thoughts are it's because of your political leanings. They they ended up like really sticking it to you. And, and it was really more about your your politics than anything else. And it's basically I'm trying to do a really uh, organic setup for this book, Karen, but it's not it's not really working. <laughs> <laughs> it was good because it's all about corruption. You know, I was going to say, you could tie all those things together. And that's probably, you know, why I immediately had a connection with Charlene is because they saw the backside of the medical community and the corruption the same way I saw the backside of that on the medical side and on the freedom side and also in the court system with what I went through with my mom. And I think once you have a loved one and you have a personal experience where you get an inside view to the corrupted system, whatever it may be, it gives you a passion to move forward and to warn other people and help other people. And I think that's a big part of the reason why I developed the friendship that I did with Charlene, because I really admire what they're doing on the medical side with cancer and educating people to make informed decisions. That's what it's about. Yeah. When, when was the first sign for you uh, at, for, at the, just the amount of corruption in, on the medical side of things? I think I always knew it was there, but you don't want to deal with it. And when you're caring for a loved one that's sick, your priority is to care for that person. It's not to worry about what sinister, you know, person is lurking around the corner. But, you know, we have to go into things with open eyes. And I think the first sign for me that something was really wrong was as soon as my mother was released from the hospital. And I started to question the decisions that I was making, because in that moment of crisis, when my mother obviously, you know, couldn't live on her own anymore. She had had a fall. I was hoping that she might go back to living independently, you know, as we all want to think that that's going to what it's going to be. And that person's going to turn the corner. I had to face the reality that most likely she was going to need a level of care beyond what I had been providing before. And the social worker at the hospital was very informed um, and very opinionated on what I should do. And you trust the professionals and you make decisions and you think that other people might know more than you do, even sometimes when your gut is telling you that something's seriously wrong. And if there's one thing that I've learned over my entire lifetime that I tell my girls and I tell my friends and I tell everybody that I can is trust your gut. When you know something's wrong, it probably is. And if I had trusted my gut at that point, I might have made different decisions, but I trusted the professionals. And very quickly, I started to realize that this is a really integrated system of people that work together that are all making money. And at the end of the day, it ends up being more of a business venture than it is caring about the elderly. And we see those connections really clearly in the present day, like an example that everyone can see if you've been paying attention is like the connection between, I don't know, big pharma and mainstream media. Um, you look at who, who is, who is paying for the airtime, uh, who the big donors are and you start to go, huh, may, might that sway the news in a way? So yeah, that, that was one of the big lessons I had to learn in the last couple of years. It's just, it's pretty shocking and and everyone's got their their a hand in the pile a hand in the pot or or so to speak whatever um, so what or the pile it's the pile it's a big whatever pile of money there is the pile there's a pile there's hands in it yeah when was so so it sounds yeah. it sounds like you you took advice maybe from people you shouldn't have so for folks who haven't read your book you're basically telling the tale of how, um, you know, you, you ended up getting charged for like misappropriate. It was correct me if I'm wrong, but like misappropriating your mom's like social security or whatever. You're basically like using it to pay for her. My mother's care. fines. It's yeah. 
It, yeah, when I shouldn't have because she was in a guardianship. The whole thing was really twisted. But what you don't realize, really, the moral of the story is, number one, you have a parent or a loved one. All the pre-planning in the world that you think you have an order, you think you have a power of attorney, yeah, you should still go out and you should do all of that. But if you know the system the way that I do, you realize that all of those things are disposable when it comes to a court of law. And as much planning as you do, if you end up in a contentious situation, in my case, it was me fighting against the nursing home that I knew was abusing my mother versus it could be in, I, you know, I don't know if you remember the artist Peter Max, but I know you're up in the tri-state area. And Peter Max was this really iconic artist in the 70s and 80s, like an Andy Warhol, a, he was a pop art icon. He is now being held in guardianship. And what happened in his family is very common too, is there'll be a daughter and a, and a son and they can't agree with what to do with that. And they start to fight and pretty shortly they hire attorneys and the attorneys end up, you know, maybe not acting in the best interest, quite frankly, and looking to figure out how to work within the system that's there. And they'll go ahead and they'll appoint a guardian. And that guardian is probably somebody that the law firm knows that's also, again, got their hand in the pile, as you put it so eloquently <laughs> earlier. And all of a sudden you're in a situation where your loved one is in guardianship and you no longer have any say and you no longer have any control. And they're they're basically being human trafficked by a legal system that is in place in this country, which strips people of their, you know, constitutional rights and makes them wards of the state. So we have this happening and, you know, it, it's happening everywhere all over the country, but it's really bad where we have elected judges. So anywhere there's elected judges, you see this level of corruption. And in 38 states with elected judges, we have this problem. So in the case of Peter Max and Lieber Max, you had a family divided and then the legal predators were able to come in, a guardian was appointed, and now of course it's a family in crisis. And poor Peter Max at the end of the day is the one that suffers in this guardianship. And although he may have Alzheimer's and it may be advancing and he may not be the same man that he is, everybody deserves a level of dignity and guardianship is something that strips people's dignity and takes their rights away. And probably the, the, the guardianship or conservatorship, I mean, everybody at this point has heard of at least free Britney and it, for a lot of people, it's probably the first time they've even heard the words guardianship or mm -hmm. conservatorship. And a lot of people very, as you know, we know very passionately, some people have been, uh, the big Britney fans have been coming out, you know, nonstop talking about free Britney. But I think very recently there was a development in her case. Well, yeah, I think it was, it was basically lifted and you have people who are like, Oh, well, yeah. she's, you know, this is all a front. She's not really free, but I don't know. It's, I can't get wrapped up in all that. So this is, this is from actually very recently. This was from just the other day. Brittany came out and posted on her Instagram. A lot of the mainstream outlets have been picking this up and this is basically her saying, okay, she's free now. Thanks. Thanks everybody for the help. <laughs> okay. So I'm here today to answer all of your guys' questions. And the first main question that you guys have been asking me is what am I going to do now that the conservatorship's over with? Very good question. Well, let's see. I've been in the conservatorship for 13 years. It's a really long time to be in a situation you don't want to be in. Um, so I'm just grateful, honestly, for each day and being able to have um, the keys to my car and being able to be independent and feel like a woman and um, owning an ATM card, seeing cash for the first time, being able to buy candles. It's the little things for us women, but it makes a huge difference. And um, I'm grateful for that, you know, it's nice. It's really nice. Um, but um, I'm not here to be a victim. Um, I lived with victims my whole life as a child. That's why I got out of my house and I worked for 20 years and worked my ass off. I'm here to be an advocate for people with real disabilities and real illnesses. Um, I'm a very strong woman, so I can only imagine um, what the system has done to those people. Um, so hopefully my little story um, hopefully my story will make an impact and um, make some changes um, in the corrupt system. And the Free Britney movement, you guys rock. Honestly, my voice was muted and threatened for so long and um, I wasn't able to speak up or say anything. And um, because of you guys and the awareness of kind of knowing what was going on and delivering that news to the public for so long, you gave it awareness um, to all of them. And um, because of you, I honestly think you guys saved my life in a way, 100%. Um, and I know there's a lot of jokes about the Free Britney movement. Um, we're not free, we're expensive. Okay, birdies, I'm expensive too.
But anyways, with that said, um, let's move forward. I don't forward. even understand that I joke. You all. <laughs> We're going to have a good year, good Christmas, and rock on. I, does she seem like anxious to you like I'm, I'm not trying to pick on Brittany but like she's the the video has got to be sped up this one is sped up so it's like that these videos are sped up I don't know I don't know what are your thoughts on this Karen I I don't know I feel like I could go I, she's like you know my thoughts are you know I think we're all a little off I'm a little off you know I think she's a little awkward she's a little off but I can be a little awkward and a little off and that doesn't mean that you need to be in a conservatorship and have your rights taken away. And in Brittany's case, as much as she was a problem child, problem young adult, probably had a lot of issues that needed to be addressed, probably was at some points not making the right decisions for herself, that certainly doesn't warrant somebody being held in captivity for 13 years. And that's what she's experienced. So I would imagine right now, it's got to be a really like awkward time for her. She's you know, being able to express herself. And I've seen some of her posts and went, wow, wait, you're really going all out there, aren't you? But you know what? After 13 years in captivity, I think a little wild is going to come out. And, you know, I'm sure she has some issues. A lot of us have issues, but that doesn't mean that you get your, your, your rights taken away and stripped of your dignity and treated like a captive and have your family profiting off of your hard work and having lawyers profiting off of your hard work and in Brittany's case she might be free now which is great I'm so glad that she can go buy candles because that's exactly what I would want to do as well and I'm so how, glad how precious the is the first thing she's like I need to go buy a candle the little things uh, but it is the little things you know freedom isn't free and that's what this country was founded on is people that appreciated that so God bless Brittany for everything that she's doing to raise the awareness because I'm sure she never thought that she was going to become the spokesperson for this issue. And here we are. So I think as much as she's really, you know, together when she's on stage, it's got to be a little bit awkward to be out there talking about a subject that you never thought you would talk about in a million years. Yeah. Also, she's been uh, so famous for like most of her life, like from a kid. And th that has that takes a toll, you know, who knows? T emotionally, developmentally, spiritually, you know, everything. It's 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 not easy to just like be famous your whole life and she's under such intense scrutiny and yeah it is so easy to be like what drugs is she on why is the video sped up and like <laughs> that's it's like you know she's probably on some stuff but like she's she's also a money making machine you know everybody had her had their hands in her pile and like at one point i read that she was only getting like her allowance for the year was like 78 grand is what she got. And now she's saying she didn't yep. have an ATM card. She couldn't like just go buy things. That's insane. I, it seems horrible. It, it's pretty crazy, but that's the way that it works. There's a man named, um, I want to say his name. Oh, his name is Doug Keegan. It took me a minute and he's in Tampa, Florida. And he was recently freed from a guardianship. This is a man who was in his forties, I believe when it happened and his family didn't approve of the woman that he was marrying. And he met a woman from Thailand or somewhere and fell in love with her. And, you know, she came over here and they were, you know, out there spending his trust and doing things that the family felt was inappropriate. And they stripped his trust away, called him a drug addict, put him in a guardianship. You know, his relationship fell apart. They isolated wow. him. And he was living, he was living in a hotel. He was living in a hotel and riding yes. a bicycle. And I talked yeah. to him on the phone. And I said to myself, when I talked to him on the phone, this guy sounds smarter than 90% of the people that I work with on a daily basis. Like this is a brilliant guy. How did this happen to him? And yeah, did he make some mistakes? Did he have a little bit of a drinking issue at some point? Absolutely, no question. And he owns that. Again, how do you strip somebody's rights and take away their freedoms? And they're living in a hotel and he was only allowed to go to certain stores. So he could go to the Dollar Tree. He could go to Winn-Dixie. He had a restricted like debit card. And those were wow. only the places that he could go. His entire life was taken wow. away from him. This is a guy who was 40 something years old with a job and a trust. And he met this beautiful woman and thought, okay, I'm going to fall in love with her. And, you know, we're going to run off into the sunset. And the family said, no way, no how. And huh. the system took advantage of him and placed him in a guardianship. And he fought tooth and nail. And I am so proud when I see people like this who take, you know, they don't take the victim stance. You know, and one of the things Brittany said was, I grew up in a household of victims and I didn't, I don't want to be the victim. 
Doug also did not want to be the victim. Doug was like, how do I get out of this? And very quickly realized there is no way out of guardianship. There are very few people that ever get out. But you know what? He stuck, he, he stood by his guns. He did all of his own legal work. He wow. represented himself pro bono. Again, I told you, I talked to him and I was like, this guy's brilliant. Like, this is how, do you like, do how does this happen? Yeah. And this is what is happening every single day in this country. And when my story was unfolding, and one of the reasons I really wanted to write the book is my story was unfolding and I felt ridiculously alone because at that point, nobody had heard about free Britney. Nobody knew what guardianship was. I would try to tell people what was happening to my mother and they would immediately judge me and look at me like, oh, you know, you must be doing something wrong. Oh, like I charge you with a misdemeanor. You must be doing something wrong. And you get into this point, like Brittany said, where it's very hard to talk about. It took me a long time before I was able to come to terms with all of it. And when I finally did, I was like, I need to put this out there. I want to tell my story for my mother, for what she went through, and for all of the families and all of the people that are in situations that you don't think it's relatable. When you hear somebody else's story and you get to know them intimately and you know why something happened, it makes that person you know, more relatable to you, but you also walk away with something. And I've always been a really big fan of reading biographies and reading life stories. So that was why the book was so important to me was to go out there and share the story of what happened to my family and share the story of what happened to my mom. And of course, there's a political angle because I've been in politics for a while and that's who I am. So certainly in my case, the politics was used against me, but at the root of all of this, I was just a daughter who was trying to take care of her mom, something that most people can relate to. Yeah. And it's interesting. Like I was playing a little bit of this uh, Doug Keegan uh, story and, you know, they're showing the video and it's like, I assume that this woman is uh, he's with, was his girlfriend or like the woman he wanted to be with who's, who's black. And I'm like, Oh, is, is this, was this about race? Was his family just, just like, they didn't like this woman. Like, I don't they know. They didn't like her. And and in, if you hear him talk, he says it's about race. He said it was about who she was and about race yeah. and about, you know, the fact that, you know, he had met her and brought her over here and the family didn't like her. I don't remember who she's from the Caribbean. I wanted to say Thailand, maybe wow. she's Caribbean, but they it's absolutely insane. were opposed to it. And, you know, you, you hate to make it that it was about her race, but certainly, you know, Doug felt that way. Doug felt, you know, that his family was completely against him. And, you know, yeah, did the guy make some mistakes? Did he drink a little too much? Did he, you know, have some issues that he needed to address? But you know what? There are people every single day that, you know, are, aren't, you know, getting their civil rights stripped and, and getting all of their dignity taken away. I mean, they stole this guy's life. I think they should be liable for this. I think the legal predatory community should be liable for what was done to Doug Keegan. And, and I think Brittany has a really great chance of coming out of this and actually suing the pants off of a bunch of people. And I'm gonna look forward to seeing it. But right now, you know, what's gonna happen is all of these lawyers, all of these people that have profited off of her, her mother was actually getting her mortgage paid in full every single month off of Britney's trust. It'll be interesting. It'll be really interesting to see because they're all gonna start fighting because they're all a bunch of leeches and they're all gonna start fighting over the money. You know, in in my own case, you know, fortunately, the upside of you know my case was I was able to continue to fight back. A lot of people end up financially broken, just like Doug Keegan ended up representing himself pro bono because he had no money. He had no way. He couldn't hire a lawyer. He couldn't pay anybody. And there aren't lawyers that are just out there volunteering to help people you know, take on huge litigation, which is what this was and what my mother's case was. But, you know, I said, you know what, if I have to scrimp and I have to save and I have to make this work, I'm going to find a way to pay the lawyer. I'm going to find a way to make this happen. And, you know, I'm going to sue the nursing home for unlawful death because they did kill my mother and my mother died under horrific circumstances. And we settled that case. We settled that case. But now guess what's going to happen? All the lawyers from the guardianship are now going to fight over the money from the unlawful death suit because they all want a piece of it. Because at the end of the day, this was never about my mother's well-being. They weren't, weren't putting her in a guardianship because they felt that she wasn't being cared for. They put her in a guardianship because they saw an opportunity to line their pockets. That's what this is. And in so many cases, whether it's Doug Keys at Keegan, Britney Spears, my mom, or hundreds and thousands of other families across this country, this is happening every single day. And there's $350 billion in assets that are held under guardianship in a year 
in the United States of America. And about 50, about 50 million of that moves in and out because obviously people are dying. But you're talking about an average of about 300. That's a huge business. $350 billion is a huge amount of money. That is a huge business that's taking place in this country. And, you know, the fish thinks from the head to the tail. You can't really take out a system like that unless we have some serious federal intervention and some high profile people like Britney Spears that are willing to come forward and admit that it happened to them. And it's interesting because we also culturally have this going, this huge acceptance of mental illness. Like we're talking about it in in the public eye more than ever. And oh, it's okay. And there's all these different diagnoses. There's so many different types of mental. So it's almost like I, I could see the courts using that or or people with ill will using that to their advantage. Like oh, well, we have this you don't know this person's they really can't take care of themselves like only i know and uh it's very sneaky and tricky i was gonna i think you sort of explained it but i was curious like if you feel like you were (laughs) you and your mother were targets of this because like of your mom's money or because of of your political leanings but it sounds almost like it's both It's both. And it started out, I think it started out strictly as a money play. I think it was a situation where the nursing home was getting tired of the big mouth daughter coming in there and giving them hell every day. And that's basically what I was doing. I, they were over medicating my mom. I wasn't happy with what I saw. I felt my mom was being neglected. And I, I became a little bit of a, you know, and I don't know what, what bad words I can say on here. I was going to use the B word, (laughs) Uh, but you know, I started to really yeah, I started to get bitch. I started to lay into them. I started to demand more. And that's what, you know, you think you're supposed to do. But it became very heated and contentious. And eventually they sent me a bill, which I told them to go ahead and shove up their asses because they weren't taking care of my mom the way that I thought they should be. And I wanted to hold their feet to the fire. And, you know, typically, and my husband's a lawyer, we're pretty smart people. We felt like we were doing the right thing. You know, you hire a guy to build a fence in your backyard. He builds a half a fence. You're probably going to withhold the rest of the payment until he finishes the fence. So we thought we were well within our rights, but what happened is they ended up hiring this very prestigious law firm, which happened to be tied to the Democrats here locally in Palm Beach County. Um, Guy's been doing guardianship for years and years, and ironically, he loves what I talk about him too, so I'll probably watch this. So shout out to Brian Um, O'Connell. His uh, uncle was the state attorney here for 30 years. So I'm not saying that there's anything criminal about what they did, what they did is worked within a legal system that is present, maybe to the letter of the law, maybe not, maybe they followed procedure, but the system is broken. And, you know, you don't think that this guy's tied in when his, you know, uncle was a state attorney in my county for 30 years. You know, he had better friends than I did, and he knew people in the federal office, and he knew federal prosecutors, and he was going to prove to me that, you know, he was going to stand up and show me that he was bigger than I was. And I do feel that that was politically motivated. The other thing that was present that I should have been smarter about is I didn't know who the players were. I didn't do my homework. I just figured he was any other lawyer. I didn't think that there was agenda. I didn't think it was sinister in any way going into this. I just thought this we were fighting over a bill. You know, I mm-hmm. thought it was that simple. Um, we're fighting over a bill. I didn't realize there was this whole other can of worms and that they were going to put my mother in a guardianship. But had I done my research, I would have seen that his law firm actually had a $16.4 million jury judgment in 2017. Feel free to Google and pull it up for the B-roll here and show everyone. It's $16.4 million judgment. Palm Beach County, if you Google that, $16.4 million jury guardianship, it'll come up. And basically, this family stuck to their guns, and they had quite a bit of money, and they felt that they had been you know, taken advantage of and that millions and millions of dollars of their father's estate had been misappropriated by this law firm and, you know, by the system. And they sued and they won $16.4 million judgment. And guess what? Isn't it crazy in the system? You would think $16.4 million judgment, this law firm must not be practicing anymore. No, no, they're still practicing. There's no what, repercussions. This what's is the just, name of this law this firm? the cost of doing business. The I cost. Pull- um, I, I would rather not say it. Oh, if okay, your okay. Wants to go ahead and, and Google it. I mean, I've given you a lot of information. Okay, okay. You know, so I, I mean, to... you can find it on the internet. Okay. This is all public information. So when I was when I was settling the unlawful death suit, um, they were sending over terms of how we were going to settle the unlawful death suit and you know get everything behind us. And one of the things he sent over was number six. I'll never forget it. Number six was Karen Turk will stop talking about corruption 
in the Palm Beach County court system. No way. And she will no longer mention our mutual matter because my attorney, oh, okay. the one that won the case against him, um, will wow. no longer mention our mutual matter of the $16.4 million judgment. So as you can imagine, I did not sign that. I'm here talking about it on your show today <laughs> because you can't hide the truth. You can't hide the truth. And the truth is what it is. That judgment exists. It's in the public domain. It is, a, it is in the media. It, is, it happened. And quite frankly, people need to be aware. Am I saying that what they did to my mother was illegal? No, I'm not. I'm saying that we have a broken system where people like this take advantage of the elderly within a legal system. And we'll call it legalized human trafficking. They're able to human traffic people for profit. They make a lot of, lot of money off of it. As a matter of fact, this gentleman in particular to this lawyer that I'm telling you about, Mr. O'Connell, Mr. O'Connell also has worked as both the guardian and the lawyer on at least 12 cases in 2017 that the Palm Beach County Courts sent him a letter about saying that he needed to be a registered professional guardian, which he was not, but he was actually working on both sides. And I'm certainly mm. not calling him out individually because there are lawyers all over the state of Florida doing exactly the same thing. So as much as logically as a child, as somebody who went through the system, it makes me say, oh, this guy's evil. This is horrible. You know, he must be the only one. No, no, there's lots of them. This is the way the system works. And these are the people that play within that system. So, you know, it, it needs to be something that's revamped and rebuilt from the ground up. And it's going to take federal action and leg legislation for that to happen because the states aren't policing it and the bar associations protect their own and the Florida bar, the New Jersey bar, all of these bar associations aren't going to go after these big time connected lawyers where a state of attorney, uh, you know, there was a, the, uh, the nephew of the state attorney for 30 years. They're not going to do it. So the people need to stand up and reform the system. And that's what needs to happen. It seems, is this an impossible task? What, like, what would a reform even look like? I don't think it is an impossible task because there have actually been other countries that have got, gone away from guardianship and have found alternatives. And there are alternatives out there. There should be a certain amount of action required on the behalf of the bar association, as an example. They could go ahead and they could vet the attorneys that are allowed to work within the probate court and they could put certain parameters on them. All lawyers right now are required to do a certain amount of hours of CE or a certain amount of hours of pro bono. Perhaps if you want to practice in the probate courts, 50% of the time that you're spending that's paid work, 50% of that needs to be volunteer work. And maybe we put these people in a position where it's not as highly profitable for them to mm -hmm. practice this area of litigation. There needs to be fee caps. Fee caps would be the number one thing that would change this immediately. There's just too much money and too much greed. Feed caps would definitely put this in a position where it's not such a competitive environment and you would get people that would possibly, you know, litigate in a much cleaner, much more ethical way. Because right now, a lot of this seems to defy ethics. But if the Florida bar or the New Jersey bar or whoever isn't willing to come down and say so, these lawyers get away with this because they're working within a system that's allowing it. Yeah, those are all really great ideas. And anytime you have something that's where there's a lot of money to be made, you're going to attract people who that is their that's their primary <laughs> concern rather than doing what's right. Oh, we have a super chat from Young Pei Chang. This is my one Asian fan, Karen. Uh, any resources you can recommend to help? Old, <laughs> I love old, that. <laughs> any resources you can recommend to help older children and aging parents protect themselves from this sort of thing? Good question. Um, I would yeah. say, yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, as much as, uh, you know, estate planning can be overturned, you know, that is your first plan of action is you should have a solid estate plan. You should have, you know, power of attorneys and healthcare surrogates and those documents drafted while, you know, you are still of sound mind and you're able to do that in a way. So your wishes are conveyed. You know, can a court overturn them? Yeah. Is the percentage small when that happens? Ridiculously small. So I think that that's the best course of action is really to get yourself a lawyer, make sure that you have your affairs and your financial affairs and your legal affairs in order and you have less chance of this happening. The other thing is as a family to make a pact between siblings, you know, brothers and sisters that, you know, no matter what, we are not going to allow anybody else to penetrate our bond. We're never going to hire lawyers against each other. We need to work out what we're doing with dad three years from now. 
What, how do you see it? How do I see it? And try to work out your problems as a family. And sometimes, you know, there are circumstances where, you know, that can't happen. But I think in a lot of cases, if these things were talked about ahead of time between siblings, there'd be a lot less emotional tension when stuff goes sideways. And that can make it much, much easier because these legal predators aren't able to swoop in at that point. And is this something you should do? Like if you have a parent who's just diagnosed with something, whether it's like terminal or something like not necessarily terminal, but will change things like dementia, um, that seems to be a good time to do it. Or even, you know, do you think even before there's any kind of a diagnosis, if just if someone's just getting older and they have, a, I mean, does it should you do it if you have if you don't have a lot of money or is it just how, how do you know if, if this is good to do? I think ideally you should do it no matter what, whether you have money, whether you don't, whether you have kids, whether you don't, you know, the system can swoop up and take you in and at least your, your, your wishes are conveyed and you have a lot less chance of it happening to you if you're well prepared. And I don't think that it's necessarily at that point a money thing. And I think it needs to be done well before somebody's diagnosed with Alzheimer's, because once somebody's diagnosed with Alzheimer's, you know, they're even when they're, you know, in mild stages and are a complete sound mind to go ahead and sign a document, that document does have less credibility once somebody is diagnosed with a, with a memory loss issue. So if you can get things done before, you're a lot better off in the long run. But most importantly, I think the most important advice is trust your gut and be your parents' best advocate. At the end of the day, when you know something's wrong, don't be afraid to speak up. Don't feel like you're alone. Don't feel like anything you do isn't going to come from uh, the right place. Because I question a lot of times, well, you know, this doesn't feel right, but, you know, I should go with what they're telling me because maybe they know better than I do. And, you know, as an only child, it was difficult to know if I was making the right decisions. But I think I could have been a better advocate for my mom had I stayed true to what I was feeling in my heart. Good answer. Yeah, that's really important. And it just feels like that's not something anyone ever sits you down and, and teaches you how to handle. It's like for so many of us, it's like we're in it before we start learning these systems. What do you say to people? Because I saw a comment in the chat and I'm like, this is something to bring up. What do you say to people who are like, oh, there's Karen Turk. That's the that's the lady who just didn't she do a month in jail? Shouldn't she be guilty if she went to jail? Like what? I mean, are you you probably hear that a lot. I do. I do. And, you know, had I had I not gone to jail, I probably wouldn't have written this book and I probably wouldn't be sitting here on your podcast right now. And I have a million things that came out of a really bad experience that have lent to a lot of great things in my life. And although it was a really difficult circumstance and a really hard thing to swallow, I would have never in a million years thought that I would ever get anything more than a speeding ticket. I, I just it's not something I've never been in any trouble in my life. I've never been yeah. accused of anything. I think I make pretty responsible decisions. I was trying to take care of my mom. And for the people that want to naysay or want to say, oh, you know, she's a Trump supporter. She's this, she's that. Or, you know, she thinks she sure her shit doesn't stink. I really don't care what you think about me. What I care about is going out there and doing the right thing in my little space that I can do and yeah. impacting the people that want to hear my story, that want to know what happened, that feel like maybe something must have been wrong because- from where I sat, there were a lot of things wrong, but you know, you can't, you can't worry about the haters. You can't worry about the people the, whose minds you can't change. But if I can impact even a small number of people by, you know, them hearing my story and relating it to some way, then it's all worth it for me. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely people like you and Britney Spears that shine a light on these issues that we normally wouldn't have heard about and until you're in it. And then it's like, not that it's too late, but you're far more panicked at that point. When, what was the first sign for you? Um, Cause in the book, you talk a lot about like you're dealing with being like publicly shamed and, and cancel culture. What was the first sign of, yeah. of that for you? When did you first start noticing? I think the like first, the first real, the real moment was probably leaving the courtroom after my sentencing and dealing with all of the press that was there and knowing by the time I drove my car home and the minute I walked in the house that there were going to be news stories and headlines and all sorts of stuff about me because I had never, I was never in the public spotlight in that way. I'd been Mrs. Florida, you know, I did some things here and there, but I was never in the forefront that way. And I had worked with so many clients over the years. I have so many friends like Roger Stone 
you know, who've been in headlines, who've been in controversy. And, you know, I've heard their stories and I've helped people in, you know, crisis circumstances in the media. It was a big part of what I did professionally, but I never in a million trillion years thought it would be me and I would be on the other side of it. So that was probably the most surreal moment was leaving and knowing that, you know, by the next day I was going to be labeled and shamed and branded a criminal which was not something I ever thought would happen. But even prior to that, in the weeks leading up to it, there were so many things that happened off to the side, like that I could feel the tension building, that I could feel that things weren't right. I could feel like things weren't going my way. And again, that trust your gut instinct was present the whole time. And I knew stuff was gonna go sideways. I knew it was gonna be a circus. I could feel it, I could see it. And that was probably the most anxiety producing thing. All of it was the lead up to it of the, I know this is going to happen. I, you know, I've always had haters and people that come after me because of my big mouth and my political opinions, but it had heated up to the point where I had like, you know, stalkers following me and taking videos of me and posting blogs about me in the lead up to me going to court. So I had all of that brewing behind the scenes. And then this big explosion of all of these national headlines about how I'm a thief and a monster and a Trump supporter and friends with Roger Stone. And mm-hmm. oh my God, she's an animal. And I knew it was coming. It was just like waiting for that like eruption. And it was really hard in the few weeks leading up to it because I wanted it to just happen and be over already. And I give you props for a lot of people. They, they come under uh, like, you know, media scrutiny or whatever. And they think, oh, like maybe I should distance myself from, uh, from my problematic friends or like, oh, maybe I need to like not associate with like a Roger Stone, somebody who like the, the media, like love to shit on. Um, but you didn't do that. And that takes a strong person. And I'm sure he, he helped, you know, advise you through this. Cause he's, he's been through so much. He did. He's really, truly, really like a really good friend. And I'm, I'm blessed to have him in my life. And You know, he is a brilliant mind. Roger Stone is a brilliant mind. He's one of those people, you sit down, you engage in a conversation with him, and I walk away knowing something historically that I didn't know before, hearing some story or some twist on a bit of history that, you know, I didn't know, and and learning, we call it the backstory. I'm working on some projects for him right now, and it's like, he's always there to give me the backstory. So I gained a lot of strength from my friendship with Roger through this experience. And, you know, certainly being branded, you know, a criminal next to Roger was, you know, difficult. And I had so many people that were like, why don't you just get out of politics and just Mm -hmm. stop all of this nonsense already? And I'm thinking to myself, no, like what, not live, not be myself, not have the friends that I've chosen that I feel blessed to have. I should just throw that all away because I'm afraid that the papers are going to call me a monster and that haters online are going to tweet shit about me. Absolutely not. Like, absolutely not. Like, I'm not willing to live my life that way. I'm not willing to do it. And, you know, so be it. You know, they can lock me up, but they can't shut me up. And really, the 30 days that I did, as horrible as it was to be in prison, you know, it was 30 days and it taught me a lot. And I walked out of it stronger. And Roger told me, you know, the day that, that the night before I went in, if you've read the book, you've read some of this, but I had dinner with him and I was like, tomorrow is going to be a shit show. I know it's going to be a media circus. I can feel it. I've had people like following me around. Like, I know that it's going to be crazy tomorrow and I'm going to walk into this thing and I don't know what to expect. And he was like, you know why? You know why they hate you? They hate you because you make a difference. Keep doing what you got to do. Stay true to yourself. You know, you'll get back up from this stronger. You will. I know it. You'll write a book. You know, it is going to be okay. Like, you're going to be fine. And he was so right. But uh, having that reassurance from him meant so much to me watching what he went through and the ridiculousness of the last few years. And really like, it made me want to hug those people harder and hold my friends tighter coming out of jail because I realized who my true friends were. Yeah. And I realized who the people who actually had my back were. And there were a lot of people that I thought were my friends that I thought had my back. And as soon as stuff went sideways, there were a lot of people that couldn't wait to hate on me. And they were the people, again, if I would have trusted my gut, I always suspected, you know, they were the ones that would talk about other people to me. And then you got to think about how are they talking about you? Well, I can tell you once mm. you're in national headlines, it becomes very transparent who those people really are. Oh, absolutely. I haven't been through even 
a, a fraction of what you've been through, but just from like my tiny little being mentioned in headlines, whatever. I did a podcast with Megan Kelly. We talked about January 6th and just like anytime I've mentioned, oh, like, first of all, it's exactly what you said. Your, your friends flake off. And, and, and I had like people reaching out. This is so dumb in high school. I hate even bringing it up, but like reaching out to my friend, Oh, just letting you know your friends with Chrissy Mayer on Facebook. And she was at January 6th. So you better unfriend her. And I'm just like, what, why are we grow the fuck up? And if that's all it takes for, and that's the smallest thing. I mean, and if, if your yours is obviously a much bigger deal and like the friends that stay with you through that are definitely your, your ride or die. And it's like, it's better. You They're figure my out ride who or this, dies. Yeah. No you question. figure out Roger Stone's my ride or die. Roger, Roger, ride or die for sure. Kristen Davis, ride or die. Mm-hmm. Think right PR. Love her. Amazing friend, amazing human being. No, you know, those people have stuck by me no matter what. And you know, they've, they've grown with me through the experience and, you know, they're always going to torture Roger. They're always going to torture people like me. They're always going to torture anybody that stands up against the system and stands up against the elitist propaganda driven, communist driven, you know, underground shadow government that we have right now. And I'm going to continue to do it because I would rather die trying than not try at all. Right. Because if they can break you, break your spirit and get you to kind of like slink away, like do exactly what those people were, you know, advising you to do. Oh, just get out of the spotlight, get out of politics. So it's like, well, they've won because they've taken your spirit down and uh, your your lust for life, basically. And Roger wrote your the foreword to your book. Um, and it was very cute. He, he wrote did. like, he was like, Karen keeps the schedule uh, of a 22 year old and has more energy. And, and <laughs> this was such a glowing like review of you as a person. I don't know. It's just so great. And it's, it's, he's you can best. tell just from the forward, it's like so the great. way he's, every time he opens his mouth, it's like, a, it's exactly what you said. He's like telling a story or it's like something out of a history book. Like the man is just like a, a walking encyclopedia. He's really cool. Um, this is so absolutely. Neat. Yeah. So yeah. Public sh- tale of public shaming. Behind the headlines, guys, where I don't want to always talk about uh, Amazon, although that is where I got this. Um, Behind the headlines, how a conservative (laughs) beauty queen became a target for fake news and cancel culture. This is really you looking hot on the cover. Uh, Where is really me? Where's the best place uh, for people to get this book and a very manageable read? We're not talking. This is boom. This is like a couple of nights. You can bang this thing out. Where is the best place for people? It's to- good. And Amazon is the place to go. Okay. All right. All right. Amazon, Amazon is definitely the place to go. And please leave me, leave me, leave me a review to book yes. reviews are always good. So if you like the book, please okay. write me a nice review. If you don't like the book, please don't write a review. Uh, but so far, most of the reviews I've gotten have been stellar. So I'm really proud of it. It's really the true story. It was really cathartic to write in a lot of ways, but I hope that everybody reading it and you, Chrissy, of course, enjoy it. Oh yeah. It was great. I was wondering, what do you wear on your way to jail? Like, how do you even prepare for that? Like you you talked about like the night before you went out with Roger, but then like you wake up, it's the day you have to like, what, bring yourself there. Like, what do you do? You wear yoga. I would probably wear like yoga pants. I don't know. (laughs) What do you do? You're going to get there. You're just going to have blue um, flag yoga pants. Right. And a red, red and white striped jacket. And I stood at the top of the stairs and the Daily Mail and a couple of other paparazzi photographers showed up and I did the Ah, Roger Stone. Classic. (laughs) That's so great. And that was it. And then I, and then they ship your clothes home if you want. I uh, took my clothes off and they asked me if they wanted to donate them. And I said, no, I would prefer to have them. And they shipped them back to my house for me. Um, or yeah, or you could just like, you know, wear to jail the, an outfit you don't really like. And then you're like, yeah, get rid of it. Wow. I didn't, that's something I have never thought about. Um, another you could question. You that. <laughs> another question. Never thought about it either. <laughs> just like, it's like, this is ill fitting here. Donate it. Um, from young Pei Chang, what are you planning or working on for 2022? A lot of things. I'm, I'm planning on doing a lot of speaking engagements, talking a lot about the guardianship issue, traveling quite a bit, working on the book tour, uh, working more with Real America's Voice. We have some television shows in production, which you're really going to like that I can't mention yet, but some really exciting things happening at Real America's Voice. So that's going to be great. 
and uh, you know, starting to gear up for 2024. I think 2022 is going to be a big part of that. So coming into the new year, it'll be interesting to see you know, what happens, what happens with Donald Trump, what happens with a lot of these other candidates. But I'm right in the thick of things down here in Palm Beach and uh, spend quite a bit of time at Mar-a-Lago. So we'll see, you know, what unfolds. How do you get ready to do a speaking engagement? Like, what was your process like getting ready for Nashville? Like, do you know, you know, do you have set like, okay, if I'm speaking for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, like what, what is your process like? My process is a lot like just what I do when I do TV, like today, you know, if I do anything, I basically will sit down for 15 minutes to a half an hour and just review the things that I want to talk about. And I try not to give myself too much of a scripted sort of speech or talk when I'm doing it. I just sort of try to stay on task with the way that the story is unfolding So I usually will write bullets for myself, like bullet points that I want to touch on, and I'll review them a couple of times before I go on stage. But if I have any sort of like more preparation than that, I freak myself out and it becomes too difficult to bear. Like I can't do a speech that I've totally prepared and memorized. That's just not the way my brain operates. It needs to be more of a bullet point system. Okay. All right. And what, and I missed, I think I missed your speech when you were in Nashville. Did, were you talking more about just uh, like censorship and like the, the courts or did you, were you touching on the medical aspects or all of it? All of it, because it really is all tied together. I mean, just from, you know, from the experience I went through my mother and her civil rights being stripped, you know, my civil rights were stripped, you know, when I was charged with this misdemeanor, like all of these things go together. And really what I tried to convey there was this aspect of freedom. That was really what I wanted to talk about is freedom, you know, and what we expect to be freedom in this country and what the differences truly are. And where does that become something where we're overstepping the boundaries of what the forefathers were thinking when they developed this country and when they outlined our picture of freedom, which we're supposed to enjoy every single day. So my speech was a lot about what had happened to me and what I had experienced behind the scenes you know, being in the uh, Bureau of Prisons and, you know, dealing with the DOJ, but also just sort of the experience of what truly is freedom and what is our expectation as Americans as freedom's concerned, whether it's medical freedom or basic civil rights. And both, both of those things are being heavily attacked right now. And they're really being heavily attacked through medical freedom. So if you think about all of the things, the agenda that are being pushed by Big Pharma, you mentioned, you know, Pfizer a little bit earlier, you didn't call them out, but I'll call them out all the advertising that they're buying to push the vaccine. Uh, Those things need to be transparent to the American people so they can make educated decisions for themselves about how they feel about certain issues. And I think the thing that's the scariest is when you think about COVID and you think about the impact that it's had on the way as a society, it has changed the perception of freedom as we know it. And under the guise of, oh, we know what's better for you. You're you're not smart enough or adult enough to make your own choices. Oh, you're a terrible, selfish person. Oh, you need to do this for your community, for others. And it's very sneaky the way they get. Uh, and that's exactly what you're saying. Like uh, so many of our freedoms are in danger now other, under the umbrella of like, oh, you need to do this for safety. And it's it's so snake like it's disgusting but that's you know that's why we have these conversations really so that is. people can see the signs and go oh okay that's what's going on um karen i adore you thank you for coming on everybody buy this book and read it uh karen where can people follow you other than thank checking, you. checking you out on real america's voice uh and they can follow you on twitter i think we have your handle scrolling down below here it comes. We <laughs> miss Mrs. Florida 2016. Anywhere else they should go yeah. to find you. Instagram, same handle on Instagram at Mrs. Florida 2016. Love Instagram. I'm on Facebook too. I have a public page on Facebook. Kind of can't get away from those traditional social media platforms as much as I would like to. I fantasize about doing TikTok, but there's not enough hours in the day. So, you know, right now, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, those are all great places to find me. Awesome. Karen, thank you so much for coming on again. Great to see you as always. Thank you, chat, for your questions and comments. Until next time, guys. Bye.